Mark 1, verses 9 through 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Today, I'm not looking for a job. I was thinking about the hiring process. Many people have, uh, are looking for a job, or graduating, soon to be looking for a job. And I've never hired anybody, but I imagine that people do job applications because they don't want to just hire anybody, right? And you need to get a, to know a person before you trust that person. So how do you do that? You do a little search, you get some basic information. You do an online search, see if they've received some prizes, if they've ever gone to jail. Um, yeah, before you hire someone, you want to know who is this person? What have they done? Where did they come from? Are they part of groups or clubs? Who are their enemies? If they have enemies, it's good to know. Read some comments. What do their enemies say about them? Another thing we do is we ask for letters of reference, right? Letters of recommendation from people who do know them. Help me to know this person. Can I trust this person? And these are good questions that we can ask about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Can we trust him? And these are questions that questions that Mark wants to explain in the Gospel of Mark. Who is Jesus? We learn where he came from. We learn newsworthy things that Jesus did. And we also get many words of recommendation for Jesus from many different characters. In the beginning of Mark, we read that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the Christ, the Son of God. And Mark says it outright in the opening line. It's a theme of the whole gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the next line talks about Jesus, the Lord. He's the centerpiece of the scriptures. The prophets of the old anticipated him and pointed to him. And then we're introduced to John the Baptist, who seems to be the rugged type, right? Living off the land in the wilderness, eating bugs, wearing leather, unafraid to call out the hypocrisy of government officials and religious leaders. Well, John the Baptist says, Jesus is mightier than me. And I, John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It's a good recommendation. And today in our verses we see two more recommendations, two more witnesses from very important persons. And we see also that Jesus had an enemy. We also get the first glimpses of what mission Jesus had here on earth. Why was Jesus sent? What did he come to accomplish? So here's my main idea today. Jesus stands in the place of sinners and is victorious. And I have two points, the inauguration and the test, followed by a few applications or implications. Let me pray before I get started. Father God, we are dependent on you for our life for our breath. Our days, our years are numbered. Our time is in your hand. We look 
look to you as our creator, our sustainer, to give us grateful hearts for all your works. We pray that the seed of your word would be implanted deeply into our hearts and minds that we believe your gospel, that our faith would grow and increase and yield much fruit. We pray that your word this morning would give us grace in the hearing of it and the understanding of it as your Holy Spirit nourishes us by your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start with the inauguration. Ordinary and glorious. In verses 9 to 11, we read about the baptism of Jesus. Think of it as a ceremonial induction into the office of the Messiah. This is the beginning, the introduction, the kickoff event to a, the launch or ribbon cutting for Jesus' ministry. He was and is eternally God, the second member of the Trinity, who took on flesh, worked as a carpenter until he was 30, living in obscurity. But a change happens here. The time was right. Jesus is about to begin that earthly ministry. The waiting is over, and the mission begins. So, this inauguration is bound to be unlike any other ceremony. But it was both ordinary and glorious. We see in verse 9, it was rather ordinary. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Seems normal, maybe even unremarkable. Many people had gone out to see John the baptizer. And here comes Jesus. It's a common name, J Joshua. Jesus came from Nazareth, an ordinary, even unremarkable village. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. Galilee is sort of out there, an unspiritual re region full of hints with accents, right? Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River, baptized with a lot of other people from Judea and Jerusalem. John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but sinless Jesus was baptized not to wash away his sins or even to repent, but to fulfill all righteousness, it says. He came to identify with sinners, to stand with sinners, to stand in the place of sinners as an act of active obedience. So, he came to represent us sinners to truly and perfectly accomplish what they could not do for themselves. He took on our nature to be fully, truly human. And an ordinary human needs to repent. So Jesus, in our place, was baptized. Well, what started out looking ordinary became glorious. And we see together the three persons of the Trinity at this moment, this meeting full of the glory of the triune God. And it's a glory that's both visual and verbal. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, He, Jesus, came up out of the water. Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. First, the visual brought to you by the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes up from his baptism by immersion, and the heavens are torn open. Something big, something important is happening. And the Spirit descends on him like a dove. I understand you're going through Genesis for a long time. This may remind you of the second verse of the Bible during the creation of all things. 
First verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The second, Genesis 1, 2, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit was present then, active at the creation of all things, over the waters. This may also remind you of the dove a few chapters later in the story of the flood. After the judgment, after the cleansing of evil from the land, holding out hope for a renewed creation of the earth, Noah, every seven days, sends out a dove. Three times. And he hovers over the waters until the waters recede. And he comes back with an olive branch. And then Noah goes back to the land to a renewed creation, a new season of redemptive history, a new covenant with God. And here in verse 11, hovering over Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in the form of a gentle, peaceable, kind, tender dove to inaugurate another new season in redemptive history. You know the verse, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A new beginning, an inauguration to mark a new humanity in Christ. There's also a verbal confirmation, another manifestation of glory, this time brought to you by God the Father. Verse 11 says, A voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. <clears throat> If you're looking for a letter of recommendation, what could be better than this? What a vote of confidence for the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. God the Father speaks on a divine loudspeaker. Jesus, I am for you. I love you. You bring me delight. And this heavenly approval of Jesus is for Jesus the mediator, our savior, our substitute, who will bring that new covenant to humans. And yet, this is all according to scripture, planned long ago, in eternity past. <clears throat> Listen to this messianic servant song from the prophet Isaiah chapter 42, one and nine. Yahweh God says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And God, through Isaiah, told us of them 700 years before they occurred. This triune celebration of the inauguration of the beginning of the ministry of Christ is glorious. Jesus standing in the place of sinners, working for complete righteousness with a confident approval of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. So, the mission starts. How will this ministry be what should the Savior of the world do first? He could go directly to Herod or Pilate and tell them what's up. He could tell them how things should be. That's effective. I like that. He could go to the temple right away. Just go straight to the temple and say, I'm here. I'm the Messiah. I'm the second person of the Trinity. Any questions? <laughs> he could go to the League of Carpenters to have a fundraiser to raise money for his ministry going forward. What should Jesus do first? And this is the second point. This is the test. Think of this. Jesus, Messiah, is tested. He's tempted. And he passes the test. 
does not fail. It does not fall. But more than that, he's representing a new humanity to be redeemed. His people. It's like Jesus is reversing the curse from the fall. All the types and shadows of the Christ in Genesis throughout the whole Old Testament, all the types and shadows were flawed, were failed, and sins. They didn't make it into the promised land. But Jesus, the antitype and the substance of those promises, he succeeds and fulfills all righteousness on behalf of his redeemed people. Verse 12 says, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. That's where he goes first, the wilderness. And I can't help but be reminded of, it, of Adam, as if Jesus is standing in the place of Adam and Eve. It says, the Spirit drove him out. Just like in Genesis 3, verse 24, the expulsion from the garden, it says, God drove the man out of the garden of Eden. And Jesus comes to stand in the place of sinners, comes as the second Adam. But his temptation, his test, does not come in the garden surrounded by God's fullness in paradise. Rather, he's tempted in the wilderness facing Satan with great harm. Adam sinned by eating in the garden. Jesus obeys by not eating in the wilderness. As if in reverse, as if undoing what Adam did and failed. And surely we could be reminded of Israel set free from slavery in Egypt, led by God into the wilderness for 40 years to be tested with hunger that they may learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. A verse that Jesus quotes directly in this temptation from Deuteronomy 8. And surely Mark's readers would think of the people in Israel in the Jordan River crossing through to get through to the land of promise. But here, as if in reverse, Jesus goes from the Jordan into the wilderness as if to undo the failings of Israel. In the Bible, we're told as Christians to flee from evil and temptation. But Jesus here is led by the Holy Spirit to face temptation, to confront evil, to defeat Satan face to face by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes to stand in the place of sinners to fulfill all righteousness as the true Israel in every aspect of the law for Israel, Jesus fulfills. He's perfectly righteous. He does not fall into idolatry like Israel did. He does not fall for Satan's tricks. He does not listen to false prophets. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> and Jesus he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. So he's in the wilderness 40 days reminiscent of the 40 years that Israel spent in the wilderness. 40 years Moses spent in exile in Gideon. Or the 40 days and 40 nights that it rained during the flood. This second Adam, this true Israel, this one greater than Moses, Jesus, who will bring in the new creation and the new covenant, was tempted by Satan in hunger, 
In weakness of his human nature, in the wilderness he was tempted. In the midst of wild animals he was tempted. Not in the Garden of Eden, but in the broken, sinful, cursed, thorn-filled world Jesus was tempted. In pain and in hunger, and yet he did not sin. He didn't curse God. He was not tricked by Satan's lies, and Satan left him defeated. The test was over. Jesus stood in our place and was victorious. <coughs> and after that victory, the angels ministered to him. And this seems to be the reverse again of Genesis 3.24, where we read that after the failure of Adam and Eve, after the fall, the cherubim were blocking Adam and Eve from the garden with a flaming sword. And here we read that after his victory, the angels were helping Jesus, ministering to Jesus, serving him. Adam failed, Jesus was victorious. Israel failed. Jesus was victorious. And it's after this test, Jesus then begins to go out to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, to redeem his people who can take on the new humanity in Christ as victorious to receive his righteousness. I have a few applications to consider. The first is a quick one, and it's repent, believe the gospel, and be baptized by immersion. It's time, maybe, for some of you to go public. You say, I am Christ's, I believe. No more super secret spy Christian. For me, I'm going to let the world know my identity is in Him. He is my righteousness. The second implication, we must receive the free gift of God's grace and be united to Christ by faith. What are these benefits of union with Christ? Adam and the sons of Adam sinned. Israel, the religious people, they knew the moral law. They knew what's right and what's wrong. But they sinned. They missed the mark. They failed the test. In Christ, because of our union with Christ, we're forgiven and declared not guilty. And by our union with Christ, we receive the righteousness of the active obedience of Jesus. He receives the penalty of our rebellion and failure. We receive the benefits of his victory and his merits of obedience. So, it's not about your righteousness. We're not saved by good works in our righteousness. We don't stay saved by good works now instead, we respond in gratitude with good works for His glory. We want to be obedient to God's moral law because of all that He's done for us. We bring our guilt. Jesus brings His grace. We respond with gratitude. Third implication or application, know that in Christ, we too have the favor of the Trinity upon us. We have the seal of the Holy Spirit. We have the Comforter, the Helper, who was sent by Jesus after His ascension. And that Helper, the Holy Spirit, is the same Holy Spirit who will help us combat temptation and empower us to live the Christian 
life. In Christ, we share that anointing of the Holy Spirit that Jesus received. We have in Christ the complete approval of the Father who sees in us the obedience of Christ without blemish, clothed in His righteousness. Many of us run around seeking the approval of others, doing favors, trying to gain their favor, while we ignore God. How many counseling couches are filled by those who complain about the shortcomings of their parents who were negative, demanding, never gave approval, never said, great job, darling, I love you, I'm for you. Perhaps you had fathers that were cold or distant, absent. Brothers and sisters, we have a heavenly father who's present and loving and looks at us and sees the righteousness of Christ. That's good news. In Christ, we have that approval we're looking for. How many are looking for some identity to go through this world? What is my identity? Is it to live the middle class American dream? How should I dress? What should I do? How do I act? And I think of the Bible that says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. How's that for an identity? You're a child of God. Oh, that we know that God loves us. Do we forget that? we would understand that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ. I read this quote recently and said it was something like, even if all of our wishes came true, but we didn't know God's love, how miserable we would be. But if our Father God's loving countenance beams upon us, even our miseries would be blessed. I pray that we would know and delight in God's love for us, and we would cherish this new identity we have in Christ. His love given to us by grace, let's not pretend we have a righteousness of our own apart from Christ, rather than we can lean on the everlasting arms of God. Fourth application. Consider this. You look like ordinary people in an ordinary church. That was in my notes, but after hearing about all these grads, I'm not sure about that.
impressions alone, when we're called to bear one another's burdens. I have a little story about this when I was, when I was a single man. I, I was a believer, a new believer, and I had an opportunity to sin. Late one night, it was a situation like uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And instead of running away from this temptation, like I should have, I foolishly stood there and thought a while. I did a little thought experiment, and I weighed the pros and cons of this opportunity. The pros were, maybe I could get away with this sin. She could keep it a secret. God would forgive me sooner or later. I'm a new Christian. The cons were, and this is what dissuaded me, to not sin. I thought, if I do this right now, I know that on Tuesday I'm going to have to confess to all the guys on Tuesday night Bible study. And then, if I do that, I'd have to tell the pastor. In good grief, it's not worth it. And I was victorious that day, even if I was a little slow. But I say all that to say, what a blessing. I, mean, I rejoiced when I came to that Bible study and I said, thank you, gentlemen, for saving me from that sin. <clears throat> and that's a blessing of the church body, working together, leaning on one another as we lean on Christ for strength to exhort and encourage one another. So together, let's look to Jesus who stood in our place, Jesus who fulfilled all righteousness. And I have one last implication, and it's number five. We must deeply and seriously examine the Gospels to say, who is Jesus? Surely Jesus is no mere employee that we can just hire or fire according to his usefulness in our lives. We can't just follow Jesus as a little, get a little religion in our life, a little spirituality. We're not hiring Jesus as our life coach to get our life together, as our motivational guru, so that we can fulfill our American middle class dreams. Is it that you want to hire Jesus as an extra? in the movie about you? No, no, he's the co-star. No, he's the best supporting actor. Listen, this, all of this universe is his production. You are not the center of the universe. The world does not revolve around you. And if you're thinking that way, when we're thinking that way, we prove that we don't understand Jesus. And we don't understand his message. So we go to the Bible and we ask the Gospels, who is Jesus? And they attest to who he is and what he's done. And they say, yeah, you can trust Jesus. You can trust him. Indeed, you must trust him. And the greatest and most important question forever. The most important decision you will ever make is, what will you do with Jesus? And Mark here tells us, trust Him as the Son of God, as Christ the Lord, beloved of the Father, the victorious one, who stood in our place to fulfill all righteousness. Let's pray. Father, I pray that according to the riches of your glory, you would grant us to be strong.
strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I pray that we would be rooted and grounded with love, that we'd have strength to comprehend with all the other saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. God, fill us with all of your fullness Thank you, Father. We know that you are able to do way more abundantly than all we pray or ask or think according to your power at work within us. To you be the glory of the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever.